welcome to another virtual edition of Mike Up Sports. As we continue the conversation about racial justice, a conversation that still has steam, and a guest who will add a little more steam in the proverbial sense is Delisha Milton-Jones, who has spent most of her adult life and probably more in the sport of basketball, recently announced as head coach for Old Dominion Women's Basketball after coming over from Syracuse, coached two seasons at Pepperdine, two WNBA titles, two Olympic gold medals, 499 career games in the WNBA, and a few seasons in the ABL. So, Delisha, I have to wonder, is this all part of your plan to take over the world? <laughs> yes, it is. You have blown my cover. Indeed, it is. I am trying to take over the world. Seems like we need better leadership anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That is a whole other conversation I think you and I could have uh, yes. <laughs> once we're done with this. Yes. Now, before we get into our, our topic here, if you don't mind me starting with the sports question, as I said in the open, and I'm sure you've been asked this, but 499 games, it was the record until Sue Bird passed it. But I have to wonder, you were one game away from being the first member of the 500 club. What happened? You tell me, because, you know, I was at a point in my career where I had fought back from an Achilles tendon rupture, um, had a plan put in place. You know, I, I, was, I was told some things were going to take place. And then when I got to the situation in Atlanta, that didn't happen the way that it was planned out. And uh, things just took a hard left for whatever reason. And I was put in a position where I had to walk away from the game with just 499. Getting that 500 mark was definitely something near and dear to me. Um, it still leaves a sour feeling in the pit of my stomach whenever I think about it. You know, not being able to just get that solid number, 500. That would have been so awesome to achieve. Well, throwing your ABL games and you're certainly over 500 and it didn't stop you from achieving a lot as a professional athlete. And even uh, amidst those 499 games, uh, Sue Bird can't claim this, one of them allowed you to make a cameo in Love and Basketball, which celebrated its 20th anniversary not too long ago. So uh, you, you got a few <laughs> perks. <laughs> I did. I did. I, and that was definitely a monumental moment you know, for all of us that were on that team back then when that movie was filmed. And who would have known that the movie would be so near and dear to so many people across the world of sports or just anyone who just loves good movies, good feel-good movies. Like, it's, it's still my favorite till this day. I have players and their parents, they recognize me more for that movie than for anything that I actually accomplished on the hardwood. That's surreal because you, it was a cameo appearance. So you go in there and it was filmed in during an actual game and people recognize you for that. Yes. And not the 499 games yes. you were a part of or the two championships. <laughs> now, granted, you could say those happened in the league's infancy. And so you know, at a time where players like yourself didn't get the notoriety that Maya Moore or Elena Deladon, Brianna Stewart are getting now, but someone's got to be the trailblazer and you know, your sparks teams, your trajectory, I guess, help blaze that trail. Yeah. And you know, that is a, that is an ideal that we all grasp. We knew that we weren't going to be the ones to cross the finish line in terms of the WNBA. We understood that we were the pillars that would allow the, the um, bridge to be built upon. And we wanted to make sure that we were a steady, foundation for the league to stand on and it can withstand the test of time the criticism um the backlash uh the the non-support it will withstand all of that and and it will continue to have a progressive future well like every good relay team you have to have a strong starter and so i guess that's where you and lisa leslie and all of your peers from that era would i don't want to say fall into but yes that's one way to look at it, I guess. That, that, that's a great way to look at it. And, and I think we took a lot of pride in it. And crazy enough, I was younger than a lot of them. You know, when the league started, the league was a mature league. 
I was a baby coming into the league, you know, a year and a half removed from college. And I'm playing alongside Lisa Leslie and Yolanda Griffith, Griffith, players who have had stellar careers in Europe on the international scene. No, they fell off the face of the earth. And they come back and we have this league and they're able to showcase their talents night in and night out uh, for anyone stateside to see. That was tremendous. But even though they were older than me, I grasped on to the, the concept, to the emotion, to the intensity that they all had. And I understood the dream that they were trying to achieve. And I understood where they were trying to take this league. So I just followed suit. And I, I feel like I was that player that was kind of getting the best of both worlds, where I was young enough to still be able to relate to the younger generation and understand that we are the ones that have to carry the torch but I was still relatable to the older generation because I understood the mindset and the sacrifices that were being made currently in order to help me better myself to have a better position in the future so that I can pay it forward to the next generations. Which of course you're doing now as a coach and you speak of the growth and maturity of the league when you came in mm -hmm. and those words have almost entirely different meanings now when you see what the league has done in the last month its players and several team staffers coaches the movement that you could say started following the death of Philando Castile when the Minnesota Lynx uh, players on that team the core fours we all love to call them up here decided to wear those custom warm-up shirts honoring Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, and five Dallas police officers who were killed. At that time, the league wasn't quite sure how to handle it. I'm sure you recall a lot of the conversation and a lot of the developments, even though I don't think you played that season. Right. And fast forward four years later, you hear about George Floyd, and it's not the first time my home state's been in the news. You see what WNBA players are doing, Renee Montgomery, among those who chose to sit out to focus on these racial justice initiatives. I think Natasha Cloud doing the same thing. So what would you make of the growth in speaking out, even though you know you, your playing career was done by that point, you're seeing what a lot of your successors have done. Mm -hmm. What do you think that says about how the league has grown, not just from a talent perspective, but from a perspective of societal awareness? Well, I think the talent perspective is obvious to see. You know, the, the league has a lot of um, um, continuity within it where you can see the, the steady progression of the talent over the years. And I think the parity amongst the teams have grown tremendously as well. What has taken place is innocent, but yet powerful. The innocent moment when someone decided to say, okay, they do have a right to use their platform and to stand for whatever they believe in. Let's fall back and allow them to do that. When that moment happened, that's when something powerful happened in the world where athletes were not just considered the ones that should shut up and dribble as LeBron was you know, directed to do but I'm glad he rebelled against that. Uh, it allowed the athletes to be viewed as human beings that are part of society, that have a voice, and they empathize with everything that's going on. And for the WNBA players to unite in that aspect and use the platform that they had available to them, it was the greatest decision that I think the players ever could have made in a stance for themselves, and a stance for society, and definitely a stance for the league. It's not something you really faced, or at least the league faced, as you were making your way through in its infancy years up to when you retired. I think the context or the foundation was always there because we've seen, and either through documentaries or history in my own research, there are a lot of events in our history that have not been pleasant to the black community or other communities of color. But when you heard about George Floyd, and I imagine you felt some sort of way when his name is part of this long list, how did you 
respond to that event and what do you think has led to this massive movement compared to just a few years ago? When I heard of uh, the George Floyd incident, or though the George Floyd murder, and we're going to call it what it was, uh, what it is, I was really floored. To think of all the others that had passed before him and how they died, uh, their lives were taken away from them. There were some similarities there, but for his, for it to happen the way that it did, it just did something to me. It shook the core of me knowing that another human being, another individual could so carelessly and easily sit there on someone's neck, applying that type of pressure with their knee, not have any type of remorse or emotion on their face while you can hear someone struggle and more than anything you can feel someone struggling for life how can you sit there and not do anything as the perpetrator or as a standby you know someone who's just witnessing the act if i were in that situation as someone who was witnessing that i really feel like everything within me would have called me to action, being the great teammate that I pride myself on being as an athlete. I would have been a teammate for George at that moment. Said something, done something, maybe even put my own self in jeopardy, but something needed to happen to break the course of what was taking place. Now, the, the powerful thing about everything that happened was it was a wake up call for the world. And it showed everyone that we need to unite and enough really is enough. And that was the ultimate example of negligence, abuse of power. This is not the right way to handle this situation. We need to do something about it. And I feel he died a martyr and it's a cause that you alluded to it, that it has steam, still has steam. I think it will continue to burn brightly for a long time because people have been angry and upset and silenced for a long time. And now with the influx of social media and how connected we are instantaneously to information and, and situations, there's no way that this incident will ever die in the hearts and the minds of anyone that is a living, breathing human being with a heart. No way that this issue can die. And I think that the stance that the league has taken in terms of the support that they're giving the players, it shows that it's not just about business. It's about lives. And if that life affected the lives of the very people that make the WNBA go, then it's important, for enough, important enough for them to sit down, listen, and support. And not just the WNBA, we're seeing that at the college level too. Chrissy Carr comes to mind from Kansas State. And how have you and your staff, your team, how have they handled this? Because you were hired, I believe in April, in the middle of a pandemic, so you know, your introduction to ODU is already far from usual. And then you have George Floyd's killing on top of it. I don't think you've, I can't recall. I know you've been around several teams as a professional athlete. This is your third school you've been involved in as a coach. I'm guessing you've never had a start to a coaching career like this one, Delisha. Never, <laughs> never have I. And I hope I never will ever have to, enter into a new job under these circumstances. Now, as a coach, you're going to go through seasons where it could run the gamut of players, you know, not being healthy, healthy mentally and emotionally, and they may want to injure themselves or contemplate suicide, or you may have issues where, um, you know, any of the normal issues that a team can go through. That is nothing in comparison to what I have experienced in my first two months 
in taking this job. What should have been a joyous occasion um, was joyous still, but melancholy in a large way because just so much sadness surrounding everything from the pandemic and then from the, the brutality and the injustices that were being faced uh, by America that was being called to the carpet by America. Um, I think our team has done a great job of, of telling their stories. You know, we've had Zoom calls with the girls and, and, you know, I gave them the opportunity to speak their piece. And we all are going to respect one another for our views, but we want to put everything on the table so we can present ourselves as a united front where everyone in this program is comfortable with our stance that we will take. It can't be individual stance. It has to be our stance. What are we going to represent? And I think the girls took the initiative. They took the bull by the horns and they went head first into it. And they were like, coach, we feel this way. And, and we want to support in this manner. And, and I couldn't have been prouder of them for, for doing that. And team building, chemistry, those are buzzwords in the basketball world. But how do you think uh, these conversations, even though you haven't played a game yet or coached a game at Old Dominion, although I'm sure you could still play, <laughs> how do you think this could help strengthen or build community ties with your new players with your new surroundings new environment as you said it's it's not a situation I don't think any of us want to have to go through again I know I don't enjoy the pandemic and I didn't enjoy seeing my home state of Minnesota be in the news for the wrong reasons again but yeah. from what you told me on that last answer it sounds like you are looking for opportunities to take these lemons and turn it into lemonade, uh, figuratively speaking? Yes, most definitely. I feel like for me, the way that I have been bred and how my DNA works within me, I am built in a way where I perform exceptionally well when I'm put in adverse situations. And I don't know if it's because of the heart that I have it's so big and it's so full of care in my mind. I'm so analytical and, and a hobby of mine is to think. I don't know if all of those things put in one make me who I am and allows me to have a resolve and a steadiness about me when adverse situations come up that I almost can squeeze every good that can come out of it possible. I do it. Now with the pandemic and with all of the social issues that are going on, a lot of people will cringe or maybe even want to go into a dark corner and, and, and be mute on this situation. But conflict or tough conversations or adverse situations, I almost live for them. Because if you handle those situations in the right way, a lot of good can come from it. I think in those moments, you get the real, the raw and uncut emotions that people have is unfiltered concentrated at a high dosage and no one's trying to sugarcoat or dance around it or not offend the next person to them they're speaking their truth and when you can have truth undulterated truth unfiltered truth in front of you and you handle it properly you are destined to have something grow from that that is positive that is unifying that will build your team from an inside out perspective and I while it's hard to go through I know that if we go through with the poise and the openness and the love attached to it then I know we'll be better for it well said and I don't seek conflict per se it, but it is one of those challenges that can help you grow and I've often credited my network of friends. I think you've known me well enough that I don't go around looking for ways to offend or insult people, but I trust them. but I've built enough trust rapport where if I say something or do something that might be misconstrued in a way I didn't intend, they'll pull me inside and say, hey, we know what you're trying to say, but yeah. this is something to look out for. So I yeah. credit that network of friends for helping me grow with these conversations. And admittedly, this isn't easy territory for me, but I knew I didn't want to 
sit idle after witnessing I was on hand to see the Lynx speak out four years ago, and that's what led me to get off the sidelines or get off the bench. Uh, since uh, we both are basketball fans, I think we yes. can get away with that term. <laughs> we can. I mean, uh, we're still working my way into the starting lineup, but uh, it, <laughs> <Keep> pushing, <laughs> baby steps. <keep> pushing. <laughs> now, as we noted, you've been around for a while, so you've seen a lot of things, you know, if you don't mind, and you can be as frank as you'd like, do you recall whether it was the first time or any incident involving prejudice or racism that you experienced or someone in your network experienced that illustrates why we have to risk being uncomfortable and having these conversations? Well, you know, let me see. Anything offhand? I mean, some of some of the things that that come to mind for me is hearing like some of my family members when we get together. A lot of my male cousins, you know, they'll they'll sit around and we'll talk and have deep conversation, and they'll relive instances where they got pulled over and they got pulled over for no reason, and you can tell that the individual um, was looking for a reason to act aggressively. So in there in my in the case of my cousins, they were really stuck because they while someone is trying to invoke a certain emotion in you, you have to suppress the very thing that they're trying to invoke because it is an angering situation when you know you haven't done anything, but people are trying to poke the bear and press the issue to get you to react in a certain way that gives them a right to do what they deem is legal. You know, so being being in a position like that and having to live your life in a way where you have to look over your shoulder and you can never be freely free. You you can't be liberated in any sense. I can't walk down the street the same way that uh, my Caucasian counterpart can. That's not living. That's almost like you're just trying to survive and adjust in every situation, in every moment within your surroundings. That's not a freedom that anyone, uh, uh, that's not the type of freedom that people should have to be confined to. They should truly be free to be openly themselves and be comfortable with that, knowing that they're not causing harm to anybody. So allow me to do that. You know, that would probably be the thing that sticks out in my mind the most. Um, there are things that can happen. I've heard stories of um, people in the workplace where you know you are qualified and you know the person that they ended up giving it the position to was not. Their resume doesn't hold any type of weight to yours, but for some reason, political, racial, sexist or not, you didn't get it. You know, so I'm glad that these issues are being put on the table for people to not have the luxury of hiding behind in the closed doors of boardrooms anymore or those secret conversations that they might have outside of the office to suppress in a systemic way those that really are deserving of opportunity. And how would you say your upbringing helped shape your perspective. You, know, you are part of the black community and proud to be one, if uh, my presumption is correct. Yes. And you've gotten to meet a lot of fellow members of the black community as a basketball athlete, now as a coach. And so how do you think that helped you understand some of the challenges that the black community faces, but also from what you touched on, how to improve embrace who you are and be proud of it at the same time it's really difficult like there's no easy way around it because even though the conversations are being had you still have to uh, lead your life with a certain level of caution because just because we're talking about it doesn't mean that it's fixed and just because we're talking about it and you have a few around you that are willing to listen doesn't mean that everyone's on board you know it's not going to have the reach or the, or the penetration that it should until there's a change of guard in certain 
authoritative positions, prominent positions, and then the different types of decisions can be made. My upbringing was one, I, I grew up in a rural town, less than 900 people. I'm from the deep South. So we knew to stay in our area and we knew where trouble would be. And you, you just knew certain things growing up. Don't, don't get caught over there during these hours down these dark dirt roads. No, because anything is liable to happen. So we knew when the when the sun go down you probably need to be home in the safety of your home out of harm's way uh, i grew up in the church so it has allowed me to have um a, a spiritual attachment with people and with life but there are other things that happened in my life that altered the course of me living with the vigor and the passion and the intensity that i live with from the incident that occurred to me at 11 years old where I actually drowned and someone found me at the bottom of a pool and brought me back to life. Um, at the age of 11, I just knew that something was different within me and it made me lead my life with a passion that many probably questioned like she's doing too much. Even on the court when I played, you know, people didn't understand why I played as hard and as intense as I did, and it was because of what happened to me when I was 11 years old. I was given a second chance. So I was gonna squeeze everything out of that second chance that I possibly can. And this is me living in my truth. And, and while I'm living in my truth, I'm able to tell my story, you know, through how I live and through conversation. Come to think of it, I suppose that you don't get uh, two contrasting nicknames like D-Nasty and Sunshine without uh, <laughs> something to back it up. And now maybe that was the origin behind <laughs> the dual roles you played. But I remember no. that story reading about it. And it, who knows, right, it, that sec without that second chance, I mean, who knows how what, what would have happened. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that scenario. Right. But growing up as you did, you in Georgia, and then you went to Florida. Of course, you were a standout high school player as well. Uh, a lot of these conversations, I don't want to say were in the back burner. They had been discussed, but not with the level of exposure we're seeing now. And my mind goes to a, like a couple of popular sitcoms, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Family Matters, that dealt with <laughs> the issues we're talking about now, almost a foreboding. Uh, the Rodney King riots happened in 92. So I think when, as you were finishing up high school and I don't want to say the culture is different because I can't speak to it. I was little in the early <laughs> to mid nineties, but what do you, what was the environment? What do you think the atmosphere was like then? And how do you think it changed or became more accommodating or more willing to, embrace the voices that we're listening or hearing now? I think that back then, uh, we were conscious of what was going on around us. But if I'm being completely transparent, I feel that the league was so young that n none of the players could, could stick their head out like that and, you know, voice political issues um, social injustices of that magnitude, we, I don't think that we could speak out like that. And if we wanted to, it would have had to have been uh, in the press conference or, or in an interview after practice with a beat writer or a prominent reporter that would want to hear your story. You know, we would have to go through a lot of uh, channels to get to the mainstream, to get to the body of water that it needed to get to in order for our voices to be heard. Uh, I think that the league probably would have had a different approach way back then because it was an upstart. We were trying to find our balance. We were trying to solidify ourselves as someone that we wanted the community to back and give their money to and to support. If if there was a division within what the players wanted and the perspective of the league, then there would have been 
probably many conversations behind closed doors of, hey, um, I don't think this is the route that we want to go. You guys need to just play and, you know, think about the lead. Maybe it would have been like that. But now that we have, we can be our own beat writer, our own uh, news breaking uh, source for the hour with social media, Instagram, Twitter, uh, all of these um, mediums that we have where we can go live instantaneously, we can elaborate on any and every subject matter, whether it's the LGBT community issues, whether it's um, race issues, or whether it's who I think should be president of the United States. It, it doesn't matter. We can talk about any and everything. And how on earth is the league going to be able to control 140 something odd players um, social media mediums impossible so because they can't control that they have to get on board and support and kind of corral all of these uh, different ideals in that kind of sit in the same bucket in the same pot how can they come in and add their own spice to it that will allow all of it to work well together and I think social media changed the game across the board in terms of the visibility to be seen and to be heard and just how impactful that the athlete's voice can be. Now the league has to make a decision. Is it really about business or is it really about the players? Because if we don't have the players, we don't have a league. And I presume was that attitude or philosophy similar when you were playing in college at Florida as, yeah, you with, mean, what you just, you mean, with what you just described? Yeah, like I, I think even back then, we, you're so young back then, like, are you really paying attention? You know, I, and we didn't have social media and were we really picking up the newspaper to read, you know, <laughs> what was going on or were we really trying to sit down and watch the news? No, you know, but nowadays everything's in the palm of your hand with the invention of cellular devices, not the flip phone joints. And you can have, you know, uh, uh, a Wi-Fi band that the strength is just out of this world and you can get information rotated to you at a high volume. They have that now. This digital age is a, is a, a beautiful thing when you want to be an activist for something. And you referenced the league in its startup phase and how they had to be more careful well, recently, one of your former teammates, Lisa Leslie, you may have read the column that was published in the Players' Tribune, and I'm not sure if you had conversations with your fellow alumni, but to see someone who you looked up to, or at least were excited to play alongside with for all those years, and we'll never forget what you did in those years in Los Angeles, but to see someone like her speak out, I kind of wonder if we had this level of communication back then, how Lisa and yourself perhaps could have been among the forerunners, but the fact that, you know, she was saying something about it, you know, still highly active in women's basketball. Did you sense that when you were playing with her and your fellow teammates that she and all these others would be uh, beacons to speak their mind when we're talking about what happened to George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or mm -hmm. Rayshard Brooks and this ever growing list that I've often said is too long. Yes, you know, Lisa has always been one that stood for what was right. And she was that way as a teammate. Uh, she always wanted uh, unity and equality, but at the end of the day, she wanted what was right. So her letter, her open letter that she wrote, it didn't surprise me one bit. Now, Lisa today is definitely not different from Lisa, from the Lisa that I experienced back in 97, 90, 97 to 99 when we, I think, yeah, back way back then, God, that was a long time. <laughs> 90, 97, 96, 97, when um, her and I, our paths first started to cross, she's always been an advocate for what's right. Now, the difference is the age that we're living in. Back then, she would have been one voice that was heard by a boardroom or by, um, you know, elected uh, 
selective individuals within the league, she would have been the one voice representing the league, you know, the players. There's, there's strength in numbers. And that's what she has nowadays is the numbers part. The game has changed in terms of that. The social media, once again, that flips the script big time in favor of the players. When you have a connection where I'm following Lisa, Lisa's following Tina, Tina's following Tamika Catchings, Tamika Catchings is following Skylar Diggins, you know, everybody's following everybody. And we can say like, oh, dang, she feels how I feel. Oh, she feels how I feel too. Well, you know what? Let's all get together and let's all take this rather than it being in the past, just Lisa or maybe Lisa and another player. Like the numbers is the, the numbers is the thing that changed the game. And that's why it has the power and the steam that it has within the league. Even just what you're saying, it reminded me of the time I had our Minty Harrington on this podcast to discuss this very thing and who knows I mean if you were to talk I'm sure I don't know how many teammates or players you got to meet uh, I'm sure that list is endless uh, with all the time you spent in this league uh, but it sounds like what she has said was echoed by a lot of your fellow alumni again I don't know what kind of conversations you've had but what does that say where you have this network that social media amplifies but knowing that you could talk to Lisa or Tamika Catchings. I know she helped lead those media blackouts uh, for Indiana back in 2016. Or even Sue Bird, uh, who's been quite outspoken about this as well, as she still uh, adds to that career games record. But everyone that I've talked to it or have observed on social media, they understand winning titles and playing all these games, that's nice. But there's a bigger discussion taking place and it sounds like from what you're telling me you're you're getting a lot of that either from what you've seen or from conversations that you've had most definitely and i feel like it has to be recognized that athletes although we're seen as an athlete and that's the tag that we wear whenever you all present us oh player this is a player of the wnba so that means I'm an athlete. She's a professional athlete. That tag in itself almost diminishes who we really are as a person. And for the athlete, we have an inner calling within us to where we feel we have the right and the need to be all of who we are. I want you to be engaged in every entity that lies within me not just what i can do from a physical standpoint to make you cheer for me and allow my team to be um, successful but i want you to engage into the mental side and the emotional side of me too to understand that there are other things that i care about and are near and dear to me other than this sport that i'm good at and i think because we have that responsibility there's a tremendous urge within all of us to say, hey, I want to be responsible with the platform that I have to do my good work within the capacity of my platform. And that's why each and every athlete, whether they have millions of followers or they have 10,000 followers, they're utilizing their platforms and their voices to be heard for the greater good of people. And I think the common theme among all of the WNBA players is the basis of it all is love and equality, no matter what the issue may be. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And times have definitely changed to where now these athletes, they're not just machines and they, they play for pay. They understand they have a responsibility from a, from a societal stance to support issues that are near and dear to them. And you've, you've seen how quickly athletes can unify just from the standpoint of look at the makeup of the NBA. A lot of the owners had to, had to change the game because players can almost build their own super team if they want. There's a power that the athletes have that they recognize just from those actions. Now imagine if we use that power of unity that we have to stand for things that we all feel is right. 
then we can definitely get some momentum behind us and make change. And that's what we are living in right now in terms of the athlete in this age. They have momentum through unite through unity and they are evoking change. And on this topic of being an athlete, how do you think your 18 years, I think it was, I forget when you joined the ABL, I know it was right after college, 97. so mm -hmm. 97. So 18 years altogether as a professional athlete in the ABL, WNBA overseas, now you've been coaching the last three years. How would you say your role as a former athlete, now as a coach, how do you think that prepped you for the advocacy that you're taking up when it comes to this racial justice conversation? Uh, I think that, um, you know, I've, I've been coaching now five years, three as a head coach, but two as assistant coach. So Thanks you for clarifying, yes. <laughs> no, problem. no problem. But I think that all of my years of service as an athlete in the WNBA and my beloved ABL uh, that I played in and play internationally in many different countries and for 15 years with USA Basketball representing our country, I think all of it has prepared me for the, um, the role of an advocate that I sit in currently by those experiences itself, having the experience of other cultures, how other people think and live, seeing what uh, a family from Russia, when they invite me to their home, seeing what their best is that they have to offer, you know, and, and looking at their best and comparing it to what my best, my standards of best is in America, it makes me become a little bit more humble. It, it will humble you in a way where you can see people on a different level and you can understand them in a different light. And it allows you to not just have this one track mind, one track way of thinking, seeing, feeling, and living. It exposes you to a lot. So when you're opened up to things like that, you can't help but to empathize and have compassion for people on a level that many will never be able to understand. Being a coach, you have to be able to empathize and have compassion because you're bringing people from all these different walks of life together to support one common goal. And normally the thing that binds everyone and gets everyone to that point is they all can probably run and bounce and shoot a basketball and do it consistently at a high rate for a long time and bring success with it. Great. But now how do we take all the intangibles within that and bring it together? And I think that background and that those experiences and my upbringing all have prepared me to be able to call myself a head coach and do it in a way that is filled with class and dignity and empathy and love. Now you can take this any way you'd like, uh, but it's, uh, there are a couple of questions that I've asked all my guests since I offered the podcast series uh, for anyone who wanted to get their feelings out about George Floyd and all the other people who are no longer with us, who should still be here. But, who did you look up to or who did you view as an idol when it came to matters involving speaking out against racism, prejudice, or even just learning to accept and embrace your black identity? Who are the people in your life that you look up, look, yeah, you looked up to <laughs> as role models that helped you get to where you are? Um, I think the first one that comes to mind is my grandmother. Because she would tell us stories when we were um, growing up about the very um, jobs that she would have to do, like jobs she witnessed her father and mother do during a time where slavery was still in existence. And then she grew up in that and grew up out of it. So she witnessed it. My grandmother is 93 now. So she's seen a lot, you know, and she would tell us stories about working in a nursing home and, and having to care for Caucasian patients that were old that would tell her stories about how they owned this plantation and these black families worked for them. And she would tell us stories about how the community we live in, 
the store that's down the road. Um, the reason why our, the 32 acres of land that she has, there's an a, a acre or two sprinkled out in between it that's not hers anymore because she had to give it to the man down the street at the corner store because she didn't have the money to pay him back for the $2 sack of potatoes that she got on Lind from them. And so they were bamboozled in a way um, and had things taken away from them uh, based off of racism and, and, oppress, and oppression. So she would open our eyes and our minds to those things a long time ago and, and to hear how she went through those things, witnessed those things, but came out of it a better person. She was my first hero when it comes to racial issues. Now, when I became a player, uh, I think my eyes were open to it with Craig Hodges. And then here being in LA, seeing the impact that, um, oh Lord, I'm drawing a blank. I'm thinking of Hakeem Olajuwon, my favorite player. Oh my God, you're Sky Hook, Blue Out Sender. Good gracious. Julius Irving. <laughs> yes. yes, Julius Irving and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You know, being the advocate that he is for justice, you know, I was really impressed with him and, and how you never really heard his name a lot in the news. And sometimes when you hear um, NBA players speak about him, they speak about him in a way where he was different. But when I read his story and, you know, I would ask questions and follow him or whatever, I realized he was different for all the right reasons because he stood for something. He didn't just go with status quo. So he became someone that I admired from afar as well. That's a good point. When we look back, well, now I know who your favorite player was growing up. Uh, and <laughs> it's hard to go wrong against Hakeem Olajuwon. I will give you that. But, you know, you would know this, that, you know, there was a time when he was known as Lula Sindor and decided to, you know, embrace the, his moniker Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the way he's gone about it, at least from what I've seen, you know, almost behind the scenes in a way, you know, and maybe not as front and center as what we're seeing out of LeBron James, for example, but as you alluded to, very much rooted in his beliefs and he is contributing to this conversation, even if he isn't on a first name basis, the way some other athletes are. No doubt. And, and I have a huge amount of respect for LeBron, you know, and everything that he's doing. And I think I, I, I will forever be a LeBron fan because he's been so heavily criticized for any and everything that he does. And I think the very reason that people criticize him, they're also telling you just how great he is. You're not going to have that type of conversation about someone who's not that great. He's on that pedestal for a reason because he is just that good. But the complete package that he presents is the thing that I love about him. You don't hear his name in the news for nonsense. He is a responsible individual. You know, he might have a glitch here or there, but it's nothing in comparison to what some other athletes have gone through. Um, LeBron carries himself in the right way. He's a family man, and you can see the value system that is important for him and how he lives his life and how he um, uh, showcases himself in the eyes of society, having the school that he built, being able to pour into the lives of youth that will be the ones to carry this torch for years to come. I think that's the best investment that he ever could have made with any of his time and money. And I'll forever be a fan of his because of that. Oh, yes. I, th that what you spoke of. And I wonder if Jordan grew up in this era or, you know, Lisa Leslie, I guess we'll throw her name into or yourself. If we had grown up with what we have now, I could only imagine some of the, you know, some of the ridiculous takes that are out there and, you know, they're out there just because people can say it, but they get, I said, like, they get it, and I'd have no reason to root against them, even if uh, they, even if they were playing on rival teams, or 
you know where I'm getting at? I do. <laughs> There's I do. more. And I guess being a beat writer for 10 years covering the WNBA, and I had some education at the U of M in journalism school, but you learn real quick, you have no control over what happens out there. So I just chose to go along for the ride. And I've often said I enjoyed the friendships and the rapport that I built more than the four links titles I got to uh, be a part of from that dynasty run. And, you know, fans would come up to you and say, oh, that's cool. You got to be with them. It's like, yeah, but, you know, they're, they're people. I'm not going <laughs> to, as we've touched on in this conversation, and I'll never forget how you and I bonded over whose line is it anyway, for example. That's something yeah. that, <laughs> you know, you might overlook if we just focused on those two titles that you won. And I'm sure, you know, a great achievement and a great moment you look back on, but mm -hmm. it's just a small part of this bigger story. And speaking of this story that you continue to write, another question I ask my guests in this series, even though you've dealt with a lot of challenges, a lot of obstacles, even if you weren't on the direct end of a microaggression or incident involving racism or prejudice, you know it's out there. That being said, you've had a lot of uh, great moments and success and a lot of achievements you can look back on as well. So what do you admire most about being a black woman? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> I guess like anybody else, I, I get a little shy when it's time to talk about myself, but in terms of being a black woman, the thing that I love the most is, I think black women are just so awesome because we can make something out of nothing. You know, you give us a dime, we can turn it into a dollar and uh, we can, we can, we can um, pour light into any and everybody that we meet. We are something that is so different from any and everything else walking on this earth, you know, just from the color of our skin and how deep the pigmentation can go from the different hues that you could see. You know, I think it just makes us so extraordinary and so exotic. I think there's so much within the black woman that is to be explored, especially our mind and our emotions. I think we are a force. And I think we're a force that was always in the background, but now people are seeing the true beauty and essence of who we are. And I love being able to walk into that on a daily basis when I look in the mirror or when I walk out my door of my home. You know, I have this energy about me with being a black woman that it just draws people to me, whether it's for the good or whether it's for the bad. And I think as a black woman, the power of the queen that lies within us can almost make people envious or uncomfortable or insecure about themselves. And it has nothing to do with me and what I'm reflecting on you. I think we are a mirror sometimes where people see us and they can either see the beauty of themselves or they can see the flaws within themselves. But um, all in all, I just think we're amazing. Amazing and absolutely perfect word, I would say for yourself and all the other people that I've met. <laughs> that's the one thing basketball has done for me is introduced me to a lot of people who don't look like me and they've taught me mm -hmm. a lot. And mm -hmm. that's something that I've taken away more than the titles or getting to be in the locker room with champagne flying and all of those things. A little while ago, you spoke of the stories your grandmother shared with you going back to the era of slavery Mm -hmm. which is something I hadn't thought about, but it reminded me, and and whether it was through your experiences or research, in terms of Black history, was there something or some event or achievement that surprised you when you first heard about it? And the reason I ask is when I've had panels or one-on-ones, I've had a lot of people tell me, things they didn't hear about either in school or through traditional methods of learning. They had to go out and discover it on their own. And so I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you ever had such an experience. Uh, let's see. 
Well, it can it can it can go as far back as the meaning behind Christmas and Easter, you know, and all of these pagan holidays that we choose to celebrate. Um, I started to question a lot of things a long time ago, like what what is Christmas? And was Jesus born on Christmas Day? Where does that say that in the Bible? Why doesn't the Bible say anything about Christmas or Easter? You know, you know, I start thinking about those things and then it's it opened my mind up to a buffet of issues that have come up like july 4th why are we celebrating this day when as a black people we still weren't free that's not an independence day for me so now i understand the relevancy behind juneteenth and i'll have to admit it probably was six years ago that I realized that oh that's why they I'm seeing all these posts about Juneteenth this that and the other and I was embarrassed when I actually realized the history behind things and mad that I wasn't taught these things especially about my culture specifically when I was growing up in grade school middle school and high school that angered me, but now as an adult, I think it's my responsibility to myself to educate myself on those things. And it's, it's my responsibility to make sure that anyone in my inner circle, be it my own kids when we choose to have some, or my niece, nephews, or my, or my cousins, um, it's my responsibility to make sure that they know the truth. And I think people have been misguided for a long time and they are in need of a healthy dose of truth syrup <laughs> to sweeten all of this bitterness that we all are having to ingest on a daily basis. Well, Delisha, if it's any consolation, I wasn't aware of Juneteenth until a few years ago myself, and it was only because one of my good friends would post about it. She would go to Boston to celebrate with her family, and in my head, I'm going, what is Juneteenth? And I, I looked it up like, oh, oh, I get it. But mm -hmm. man, that's something I never had in school. And I came a little bit behind you as far as the schooling went. But I think even in elementary school, we were still celebrating Columbus Day. Which, exactly. Uh, it, it, now that's turned on its head. And it's just crazy to think how it wasn't that long ago. I mean, slavery was... 150, 160 years ago. It's not uh, that long. The area your grandmother grew up in where segregation laws are still prevalent, that was yeah. not even 100 years ago. And yeah. I had a conversation with a friend recently about the Loving Day or Loving versus Virginia, the Supreme Court case that struck down laws banning interracial marriage. That was only 53 mm -hmm. years ago. So we're not that far removed from these Our events. Mistakes. Mm -hmm. Right, mistakes. And I think it's a testament as to maybe why you and I weren't aware of things like Juneteenth until recently, because it wasn't something that got a lot of emphasis. And yeah. even this year, you saw more prominence featured on June 19th, but it took a while to build up that steam. And I came across a lot of those conversations you spoke of with Independence Day as well. And I think I released one of my podcasts and I made reference to the fact that, yes, we celebrate our independence, but that includes freedom of expression, uh, which I'm glad we're able to do now. Yes. And on a segue from that, what can we do to move this conversation forward? And I say we because it does take a collective effort. I mean, you and I both have a shared experience in terms of not knowing about Juneteenth until recently. So mm -hmm. it is going to take all of us to bring meaningful change and to keep more names from being added to the list of hashtags. So mm -hmm. what can we do to move this conversation forward in a positive direction? Well, I feel that um, number one, you have to have willing participants. Willing participants to sit down and have uncomfortable yet necessary conversation. And if you have willing participants that are knowledgeable about the information that they're sharing and they are responsible 
for the emotions that the information can invoke, then you are on your path to having some positive changes take place. But that's on such a sub level. Now, if we want to get a lot deeper or go a lot higher, then we have to eradicate some of the things that are in the history books that are being taught. And I think the problem starts probably in preschool, if you think about it. If you have teachers that are responsible for how they allow kids to interact and integrate with one another, and they do it in a graceful way, then the racism issue can almost die on that infant level. What they experience in their individual homes can be a different thing. But when they're put into society with a group of people that don't look like the group of people that they go to bed with, wake up with, eat, break bread with on a daily basis, then you allow them to have an opportunity to gain experience. When they gain that experience of different cultures and understand when, when the little Caucasian girl in the class can see that the little um, black girl in her class is just as smart and speak just as well and wear just as pretty clothes, then there's a respect that can come from that. And the little Caucasian girl is now enlightened. And it's not about her um, skin and her um, her bloodline being deemed as prominent, better than, smarter than. She can see that other people with other races that don't look like her can be just as smart and just as successful. If it can start there and it can carry itself on, and now we change the, the, the way that, that literature is being taught and how it's read and perceived um, in the books, then you can start to change the minds. And if you can change the minds, then you can change anything. And on that subject of changing minds, if you had a chance to go back and converse with your younger self, because you touched on how difficult it was to really share your voice in a fluid way as a college athlete playing for the Florida Gators or in the early years of your WNBA career when we had more filtered platforms. But if you had a chance to revisit your younger self in the context of this conversation about racism, about prejudice, and about all of these issues that are still afflicting the black community, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. I'll give you an example of who I would have been back then. When I watched the movie uh, Harriet, and I saw the powerful force that she was, and I put myself in her shoes during that time span, I would have been Harriet. I would have been that brave soul that would have been like, oh, no, uh-uh. I want better. I know better. I'm, I'm going to do better. I'm going to go find better for me and for anyone else that shares the same sentiments, and especially for my family. That would have been me. If I had to live during the times of slavery and being oppressed like that, I would have been the one fighting back every day. I would have been that stubborn mule. I would have been. So knowing what I know now, if I knew it then, the best example that I could give you would be I would have been Harriet Tubman. And you know what, Delisha, that doesn't surprise me one bit, <laughs> just knowing <laughs> the kind of player you were and the human being that you are through all of our conversations, <laughs> you would have been, because uh, something I've learned about you over the years is uh, you're not afraid to defend uh, your teammates, defend the people you care about, and even if, <laughs> no matter the repercussions, and you know, you're, you're not afraid to stand up for them. We've seen examples of that uh, throughout your career. Yes, and that's why I was pegged with the name D Nasty, you know, because just because of that, that, that act, that gracious act of being the ultimate teammate and having my sisters back, 
I was de- I was tagged as being a menace, you know, but maybe I was a menace with a cause, <laughs> the way I see it. Hey, at least you were a menace who didn't punch me in the face, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful for that. <laughs> No, but hey, I've just learned over the years, whether it's high school, college, or the pro, and you and I, we could have so many conversations in this dimension as well, or in that dimension. I mean, I grew up covering the Minnesota Lynx, of course, because I live in Minnesota. And so the teams they love to hate were the Sparks with Candace Parker and the Mercury with Dana Tarazi. And only because... You know, they were so good and they're not afraid to express themselves. You know, when Candace right. gets frustrated or t- Diana Tarazi, you can tell when they're not happy about something. Right. But Tarazi comes to mind in particular, and this just goes to show how people tabbed you as D nasty, but without that perspective, you kind of lose sight as to what that means. Well, Diana Tarazi, for example, you went against her for all those years, played alongside her with USA basketball and <laughs> She uh, left nothing on the floor. You know she would go all out and highly emotional it would show and she would really get into it. And uh, uh, there was more than once where she maybe dropped a few F-bombs, but (laughs) when you talk to her after games or when I interviewed her away from it after, you know, shoot around or after a game, one of the most gracious interview subjects I've ever had the pleasure of uh, doing business with and you know you were the same way you understood that what happened on the floor is just one part of you but yes. not the whole picture and when you mentioned D nasty or how folks kind of gave you this reputation of maybe being aggressive or mean and it's like well on the court perhaps but away from it you knew when to turn it off correct that's correct. And I, I learned that in college. I was so sweet. I was just a piece of apple pie. You know, I would be playing in the game, getting pushed around, getting, you know, just getting taken advantage of. And if I'm running down the court and a, and a player from the opposing team would fall and we're in, tra- we're in transition about to score a layup, I would stop and, and try to pick the girl up. You're, are you okay? And I guess my coach, Coach Carol Ross, had had enough. And she called the timeout and she pulled me over. And she said, hey, look. She was like, either you're going to give the first lick or you're going to get the first lick. Which one do you want? And I was like, uh, give? And she said, that's right. Now get on out there and hit somebody. <laughs> you know, like, stop. This is not the time or the place for you to be so sweet and so kind. You're not supposed to care about your opponent like that. So she was the one that woke up the lioness within me and allowed me just to play with that no nonsense. I'm supposed to throw the first lick and let's get this party started because I'm setting the tone and letting you know it's going to be like this all game long. And once the game is over, I can, hey, girl, hey, with the best of them. And we can go eat and have a good time. But in between those lines, it's on. I forgot you had Carol Ross as a coach way back when because <laughs> Arminti had her too. And I, I want to, I'd almost want to follow up with Arminti and wondering if she got a similar conversation. <laughs> I'm, try- I'm glad we have Zoom because I was trying not to laugh. And if I did, it would have seen it on our Zoom feed. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to give the person the first lick. And I'm guessing that carried all the way through, uh, through your Girl highs now. and lows, because uh, <laughs> I didn't know you then, but it goes back to, it's like, you know, the, the highs being the title runs and I don't know what your low was, but <laughs> it's like, it goes back to, I think I remember, oh, you and I, we could have so many conversations with this, but you know, the brawl with Detroit and I, you, you oh did, my. <laughs> but and you were defending your team and you know, yes. there, there might have been some things you would love to run back if you could but just another yes. example of uh, I guess was that Carol <laughs> you were really giving the first slip but you know hey it's just one of those uh you know you're gonna defend yourselves <laughs> in that instance but you know and of course we all laugh about it now because it's long since passed and right <laughs> uh we've all done 
there are all moments like that, but man, <laughs> that is <laughs> I'm just, I'm just wrapping my head around. And and the and I laugh because I could see that out of you, even just how gracious you were with me and several other reporters. I mean, you you would have no reason to introduce yourself to me the way you did, but you did. And I'm grateful for that because uh, we've had a lot of uh, fun and a lot of uh, fun conversations since then that if you hadn't made that gesture, who knows what would have happened. And yeah. just hearing that and then hearing Carol Ross come at you <laughs> for not going hard enough. And I, and the SEC, well, you had Tennessee back then and it's still a really tough conference, but still, <laughs> Right, Alicia, right. Why did you do this to me? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, no, it's fine. I'm just, I'm going to have a little bit to edit out, but that's fine because it's like, hey, these are conversations I could have with you that I couldn't have with maybe a first year player or somebody who right. I didn't have a chance to uh, uh, get to know the way I have with you. And trust me, there is not a day I don't regret it. Uh, no matter what highs, lows, mistakes I make, I'm just glad you're uh, willing to help me learn and grow from those mistakes and vice versa. Um, uh -huh. There are a couple of questions as, believe it or not, I, I do get close to wrapping this up, <laughs> but there are a couple of things I wanted to get your take on and speaking to all the things you've been a part of and what you would have told yourself, how you would have been a Harriet Tubman if you had the chance to go back and change uh, the space-time continuum or change your own timeline. Uh, even though you haven't played a game yet and who knows what the season will look like. I saw the schedule was released today, but what are you most excited about in your new role at Old Dominion? And what are you most excited about in terms of providing that leadership role for your student athletes who are navigating a lot, navigating a pandemic, navigating how to use their voice to bring attention to issues of systemic racism. How excited are you to take on that challenge? Um, I think that the thing that I am most excited about right now is to actually see my team face to face because I have yet to do so because of the pandemic. I've seen them on Zoom calls, I've seen them face to face on FaceTime, but I have yet to see them in their physical form face to face so that brings me a, a large level of excitement for that um, in terms of the season being able to pick up where they left off that's the thing that excites me the most because they were they were about their winning ways and I want to be able to not get in the way of that and just enhance whatever it is that they already have so that they can continue to cross that threshold of being able to call themselves a champion. That would bring me the greatest joy is being able to see them do things that I have done in terms of raising banners, cutting down nets, feeling the, the confetti fall, hearing the song, We Are the Champion, going through those grueling days of training where it's them against me, me against them, uh, us against the world and being successful as a result of it, I can't wait for that. That brings me excitement. Knowing that I am someone who has been a journeyman, so to speak, a world traveler, and I have so much experience and I've won across all continents, I have experiences that they can, I can be a soundboard for them. They can come and they can talk to me and we can relate on any and every issue, whether it's for social change, uh, whether it's um, things that they may be going through personally with family, friends, relationships, basketball, you name it. I feel like I am a great person for them to come and utilize as a resource because I've been through so much and I've seen so many things that I can help them navigate those murky, choppy waters that they will have to ride upon at some point in their young lives. And speaking of the journey woman, I guess is the appropriate term. Uh -huh. Journeyman, <laughs> I know is the common one, but right. journey woman, 
we got to make that a thing. Okay. Uh, you know what Put I'm saying? Put it on a t-shirt. Put it yeah. on a t-shirt. <laughs> well, just because it, with women's athletics getting more prominence with women's basketball, soccer, I think it's one of those deals where, hey, you know, folks like yourself, you played for a few teams. So it wasn't just in LA, even though I think we most associate you with that. But right, right. from your time as an athlete, and this is something I've asked of all of my athletes, past and present, what would you say was the most exciting moment and your most embarrassing moment at any point in your athletic career? Gee whiz, that's a tough one. That's since I've played for 18 years. How am I going to answer that? Let's see. <laughs> um, most exciting moment probably would be... <laughs> this is going to sound so bad. <laughs> probably getting my first um, European paycheck because I was like, oh man, this is that now I'm, prof I'm, a, prof I'm a real professional athlete. <laughs> yeah, but then I would definitely have to say on a serious side, winning my first gold medal. Oof. Like that's the creme de la creme. You know, I think it's better than that. Um, unless you do it back to back in the WNBA. Now that's pretty special too. <laughs> Most embarrassing moment. Um, probably the brawl. <laughs> the brawl would probably be an embarrassing moment because um, it was just it was just bad. It was bad. Although I was innocent and I was trying to protect my teammates, it was just bad that the the league didn't need that that little blemish mark on it. Most exciting would be tough for me too because I've. I, I don't have a championship or gold medal of my own to speak of, but mm -hmm. I've been on hand to witness so much history. Yeah. And it would it'd be so hard. I guess on the serious note, it would probably be Maya Moore's game winner in game three mm. of the 2015 finals. Mm. Because as you saw, the Lynx and the Fever, that series, even though the Lynx and Sparks had the bigger rivalry, the Lynx and Fever had a couple of strong series where Indiana pulled off the upset card in 2012. Right. And then right. it was back and forth in 2015 until the very end when Sylvia Fowles and the rest of the helped Minnesota pull away. And I remember that was a big deal when she came in mm -hmm. midway through the season. Uh, the Lynx Sparks rivalry, uh, I guess that's up there too. And well, you were part of that first, uh, I think the first playoff series. So you were on hand. Well, it didn't go as well for you. So I won't bring that up. But, right, uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to play, uh, you got to write the first chapter. Um, well, wait, I, oh, it didn't go well. That's right. It was game one, but you took the series. So I guess it did work out for you. So maybe you didn't yes. end as badly. Was, the start wasn't good. The finish was bad. <laughs> the start wasn't. <laughs> uh, but 2015, WNBA finals and then on the more amusing side because I never would have guessed that first European paycheck I was thinking oh you'll pick your titles uh, because <laughs> that would be up there that would be at the top of anyone's list but when the Lynx made their first run in 2011 Simone Augustus made me wear her headbands <laughs> And it was because they were selling some merchandise or trying to get the Los Links hashtag going. This is when Twitter and social media was still developing. Mm -hmm. And I forget what, I made some quip about how I can't get involved as a reporter. Of course, if you hang around these athletes long enough, you're going to get to hear some of the stories. So Simone, yes. and you know this, I, she's not afraid to have fun at the expense of everyone else, decided to have a little fun with me and... Uh, maybe wear her game board headbands. I could feel the perspiration on them. So uh, I still have gross. them. That, that was gross, <laughs> but I still have them. Uh, so, oh, wow. And the most embarrassing moment came in my first season when I first started covering the league in 2009. It was the Camp Day game. And I don't think I've said this on air, but I'll share it now. It was the Lynx and Atlanta Dream. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't familiar yet with the home and road team protocols because uh, a lot of times they'll make the uh, teams available at the same time. And so I covered, did the links presser. Then I tried to get uh, word from Atlanta because I try to you know, get both sides when I can uh, for gamers and other things. So the security guard thought the access period was still open and it wasn't. 
but the door to the locker room was open. So I walk in and I happened to walk in while Atlanta was changing oh. from their jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> and you should have seen me like floor it in a professional way. I didn't freak out, but <laughs> In the most professional of ways, I turned around and just got out of there as quickly as I could because, <laughs> as, and you can understand why. I mean, I'm a guy. You know, it was my yes. first year just out of college, but still a guy walking into a locker room full of women. Uh, that could go south in a hurry. Um, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> and from that point on, I always made sure to check when they were open or I would go to the visiting team first because usually they would uh, – take care of their stuff before the home team would uh, when I do Minnesota games. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was, I don't know where that would rank, but it's like you had the brawl. I had a moment where I almost could have walked in on the team when they were, <laughs> when they were <laughs> going through a wardrobe change. I don't know well, what's well, worse, but <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this as a coach, I had an embarrassing moment. Um, we were in uh, North Carolina, I believe, North Carolina, uh, at a recruiting event, and the gym was packed. I'm talking about Gino was there, you, every, you know, all you, uh, all the who's who's in um, D1 women's basketball. I'm sitting, <laughs> I'm sitting behind the basket, courtside. Gino's to my right, and I can't even remember who was to my left. And the gym is packed and it's hot. I go get something to drink and I come back. I set my drink down and I go to sit down. Watching the game and then out of nowhere, the chair just collapsed. It just breaks. It flattens. And it made the loudest noise like a gunshot, like pow. And I hit the floor so fast. And I tried to get up real quick and Gino saw me struggling and he like... <laughs> He had to grab me and like, y'all, you all right? And I'm like, I'm good, Gino, but I'm so embarrassed right now. The players on the bench, all their heads all whipped around like, what is going on over there? The ref stopped and looked. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> and this is when I was working um, with Syracuse as their recruiting coordinator. So, yeah, that, that was a pretty embarrassing moment for your chair to break in the middle of a crowded gym and Gino Oriyama is sitting to your right and has to help you up off the floor. Not good. Was that the first time you met Gino? No. Uh -oh. Okay. On the 2000 team, he was one of the assistant coaches. Okay. I was going to say, how, how, how silly would that have been if that was your first meeting? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been bad. <laughs> that would have, well, it, you never would have forgotten it. I know that much. Well, you're not the first and you won't be the last. You'll have a chair <laughs> go, Unfortunately. Uh, go, go unhinged on you. But uh, that, I mean, just, <laughs> and I'm thinking just the, the, not the logistics, but yeah, just surrounding it. Yeah. You know, you're at six foot one and I've met Gino once in person. And so I think I'm taller than he is. And so he's helping you up. And so just the, uh, <laughs> the irony with that. Right. <laughs> but Hey, right. you know, it's an extended family. So at least he was willing to help you get up. But yeah, <laughs> I know because if he did, wow. I probably would have had to give him an elbow or something. <laughs> 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 well, I, and before we go, I guess, is there anything else you'd like to add, whether we're sharing these laughs about our silly basketball stories or these hard-hitting conversations? Just what would you like to leave the audience with? Um, I would like to say that I am so proud of the stance that all of the women of the WNBA and the men of the NBA are taking. I love the fact that they are beautifully representing their voices and they're doing it in a unified way. And they definitely have the attention of the world. And keep speaking your truth, keep standing for what's right, and I think our day in the sun will come. Well, justice will be served, and it will be had by the individuals that deserve it. And um, I would also like to say to all the recruits out there, <laughs> Come holler at me at ODU. We're on to something special. I think it's a beautiful thing in the making. Why not come be a part of it? I think earlier in this conversation, you were referencing monarchs or royalty, and maybe fate had you at ODU. Who knows how long you'll 
be with the monarchs or the lady monarchs, I think is the official mm -hmm. moniker, but it's just, it's the monarchs. Okay. Now the monarchs, but still, mm -hmm. Uh, life has a way of fitting you in places that you didn't necessarily expect, but in a way it, it fits seamlessly. And so when you're talking about how you see yourself as a queen and a monarch, perhaps this is. old dominion job you know, puts you right at home. That's right. <laughs> well, I know you had a good two years at Pepperdine. And I remember when you took the job at Syracuse, I was surprised because it looked like you were uh, building up that program, but it, now you get that chance to do so with Old Dominion, and I know I'm excited and to see what you do. And when I thought of you for this podcast, Alicia, I didn't know what direction this would go in, but I, I'm glad to know that you and I and anyone else watching this too, that we can discuss hard-hitting issues that can really tug at your soul, really wear you down, but at the same time, we don't forget to have some laughs along the way. And I feel this conversation emblematic of that. And I'm glad you and I got to share a lot of stories. And if we had more time, I think you and I, we would need a whole day, I think, just to share <laughs> so, some of these anecdotes and experiences that you and I got a chance to be a part of. Uh, you're a little more traveled than I am. I haven't gone around the world yet, but mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'll never regret getting the chance to meet you and getting to see you play your last couple of years in LA and finishing your career. Even if you didn't get that chance at a 500th game, I go back to what I said at the start, 499, that has some notoriety to it. So if there's like a 499 deal that Old Dominion offers or some way you can tie that in, <laughs> I just smell opportunities that you might not have had if you were able to get that 500th. Got it. Got it. I like it. And I like the way you think. And, and I want to say this to you. I'm so proud of you. I am. Because I remember when you were so green and, 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 and you were so nervous and you had so much respect, but you still wanted to, you know, uh, be professional and do your job. And you were trying to figure out your identity and to see you then and see you now and see you stand the test of time I just it just warms my heart and I'm so proud of you you know you keep doing what you do believing in yourself I love it and if you just joined us I think I turned a couple of shades redder <laughs> <laughs> I, I truly appreciate, appreciate that Alicia that. it is heartwarming to hear I know you and I have supported each other and even though I've taken some time away from the WNBA now, just because I had a lot going on and it wasn't easy, but I could tell I was doing a little too much with the MLB job that I added a couple of years ago. And as you've seen, I will always support the women's game. It's always taking me places. And I say this all the time. There are people who ask me, why do you cover so many women's games at the high school level? And I've said, because it's my most watched sport. Mm. And I don't know what the mood was like when you were making your way through high school, which was, oh, if there was, oh, bad. If tape of that ever surfaces, <laughs> look out. But what was that? I said, oh, my gosh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> or even your Florida days. There's got to be something in the archives. <laughs> yeah, some bad hairstyles. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it wasn't bad back then. I mean, it was in. It's just one of those, oh, I can't believe I wore that. But, you know, <laughs> but it just speaks to how much the sport has grown where I'm sure you've heard about Paige Beckers and AZ Fudd and what they're mm -hmm. doing to grow the game at the prep level. And that's why I'm going to keep doing it. I hope to find myself back in the WNBA at some point. Uh, probably not this season, the way things are going. I might have to wait until <laughs> – 21 to make a true return because they're playing at you know the IMG Academy but yeah. that's what I miss I mean do I regret taking some time off no but what I miss the most are the relationships and hearing mm -hmm. those words Delisha that means a lot and I'm, I'm just thankful of how much you and I have grown and continue to catch up with each other so uh, thanks for making me blush <laughs> Yeah, you definitely turned about four shades redder, <laughs> for the record. 
<laughs> but you are welcome. You're and you're deserving of that. You really are. Well, like yourself, Delisha, it's not easy to talk about myself, and I still have a hard time doing it because you don't want to make it about yourself. And it, from what I gathered in this conversation, you weren't about that, even if you got a bunch of headlines from your love and basketball cameo, or the two titles, or the gold medals. I mean, I. Uh, I'm going to date myself, but there's a part of me that wishes, oh, like, I was a teenager when you won your titles. It would have been fun for me to, I didn't fully embrace the sport until Wayland's Final Four in Minnesota. Mm. And so I just think about all the history I missed out on. And it's like, oh, if I were around or what, how cool it would have been to see Nikki Teasley's buzzer beater oh my on TV or, or you got to live it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what a or, moment. Or the first one at 01 and just all the the first team. I think, didn't you beat Houston or was it someone else that year at 01? Charlotte. 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 No, Houston was in the West though, weren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. what, who was that team? I think it was Charlotte in New York. You're right, but you're right. didn't you have to beat Houston in the West to get there or was Houston oh. still in the East? Uh, I, no, they, I think they were in the East then. Okay, they were. That's mm -hmm. right. I'm yeah. so used to them being a Western team and everything else. So. Yeah, they were in the East then. <laughs> but uh, I don't know how to wrap this up, so maybe we should just do it. But, Delisa, <laughs> thank you for your kind words. As I said earlier, I feel like I'm referencing this conversation or past moments in this conversation, but you were known as Nasty, but you also had the moniker Sunshine, and I can see why you got both. And let this be a lesson to any future players. It is possible to have both and <laughs> embrace it. Yes. I mean, you, you seem to be fine with D-Nasty uh, because it describes <laughs> My mom doesn't more. like it. My mom's like, I don't like it when they call you that name. And I was like, Mom, I know. that." But she was like, because they, they have it for the wrong reasons. You're not that. You're just tenacious when you play defense. And I said, yes, Mom, you're right. <laughs> you're right. But Tenacious D was already taken by Jack Black, and I forget who else is part of that group. So, you know, it, it, <laughs> the nasty made sense. <laughs> oh, but the nasty and sunshine. But, again, it's okay to be both because, as I see with you, and I see all the time at every level, there is a persona that the players exhibit on the court that you don't see away from that. And you are a living moniker. So thank, thank you for those you. kind words, Delisha, because I know even this weekend, I have some rough moments and to know that you're still part of my fan club, as crazy as it sounds for reporters, we get them too. Uh, that means a lot. And so oh. if I know I'm sure you and I, We'll cross paths again. I don't know when, but I know if I'm going through a rough spell, I know who to get a hold of. No doubt. No doubt. And you can always draw on that comment because it's from the heart and it's legit and it's for valid reasons. You know, you've, pro you've proven it. You've proven it through your persistence and resiliency. Well, thank you very much. And selfishly, I would have loved to have seen you get that 500th game, but I think I said this when you were tired. You gave us 499 reasons to appreciate everything you've done and continue to do as a coach and as a spokeswoman for women's basketball. One of my old friends told me, you meet a lot of people through this thing called basketball, and I'm glad to say you're one of them. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And this was a lot of fun. It certainly was. Delisha Milton-Jones, head coach at Old Dominion. Hopefully you'll see her on the sidelines this upcoming season. But if not, we'll see her again at some point as we make our way through this pandemic. This is just a temporary pause. Yes. And we'll find a way through this and we'll get to have games again. And Delisha and I will have some laughs again at some point. I don't know no. when, but... Uh, <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. But... Keep an eye out for her on the sidelines. And if you want to be a guest on a future episode of this podcast series, be warned, we might run off on tangents and make us laugh, but that's okay. But just contact me at tsbtelevision at gmail.com or on social media, Twitter and Instagram at the Mike Eden. As long as you have a story, no matter what it is, we'd be happy to have you on. That does it for this edition of Mike Up Sports. Thanks for watching. <laughs>